Yeah. Hey, mister. Mr. Fourth Quarter, Mr. Make It Happen, Mr. Clean, what's the addict, Mr. I Keep Your Bitch Happy, Mr. Cool, damn the Mr. Cool, damn the Ice Cube, Mr. Cal- Mr. Donut, Mr. Freeze. No, we're talking about the Mr. Project FPGA, hardware-based emulation for cycle-accurate gaming of retro consoles, computer systems, and arcade machines. In this video, I'm going to walk you step-by-step step through the process of consolization of a Mr. FPGA into one of these mini ITX cases. So why would you want to consoleize a Mr. Setup? Well, there's a lot of pros and cons to it. Besides looking cool, you get a form factor more like a console so it'll fit better on your shelf. Another benefit is you can have just the Mr. under your TV instead of a plethora of your original consoles and you don't need a PhD in cable management to keep things looking nice. But the biggest benefit for me is the protection of your Mr. boards. My biggest concern before building the Mr. was all the vulnerabilities of it, it's such a small form factor. You got all the various ports just right there out in the open. Hell, some of the cables weigh more than the Mr. FPGA itself. So putting it inside of a case isolates its boards and its connections from the stresses of plugging, unplugging, tripping over cables because you're using extension cables to flush mount ports onto the outside of the case, which will keep the ports and various connections on your Mr. board safe and sound and free from wear and tear. The cons to consolization is it does cost money. I probably spent around another hundred bucks just to get all these components to do this. You could break that price down to probably a third or less even if you ordered from AliExpress but I didn't want to wait a month or two for these things to arrive. So I had to cover the pros and cons real quick because I was asked that on Reddit before. So there's that. I also do want to mention real quick that, yeah, the Mr. Multi-System has came out and I, I think it's a push in the right direction. And I would have been all over it if it would have had an ABS injection molded plastic case. I'm not a huge fan of the 3D printed case. Um, you can build this in a mini ITX case for probably cheaper than the Mr. Multi-System if you plan ahead of time and order your components from China from AliExpress. And a lot of people, myself included, uh, like taking the do-it-yourself approach. So if that's you, then this is for you. Let's get on to the build. The first thing you're going to need, of course, is your DE10 nano board. Here I got the standard or the analog IO add-on board. I got this from Mr. Add-ons and uh, it came with the heat sink. A maker spot, four port, USB OTG hub. Here we got an upgraded five amp, five volt power supply. Totally optional, but I think totally necessary. 5.5 by 2.1 millimeter power jack connectors, male and female. Micro SD card extension. USB-A to USB motherboard header adapter cables to tap into the USB ports on uh, that mini ITX case we got. A 3.5 millimeter TRS pigtail. Ethernet flush mount extension. The 128 megabyte SD RAM upgrade. Three millimeter assorted screw set. 19 millimeter latched push button very important you get the latch this one's rated for 12 volts it's got the halo leds you know it's latched when you click it and it stays in the end position i bought packs of red yellow and green 12 millimeter momentary push buttons these also got the halo leds and are rated for 12 volts you're better off getting these buttons in 5 volts but 12 is what i got and I ended up working a USB Wi-Fi dongle, your USB controller of choice. I went with the M30, 2.4 gigahertz. You'll need a USB wired or wireless keyboard. I got the K400 Plus because I already had it and it's a decent little small form factored keyboard. It's got the little Bluetooth dongle built into the battery cover there. Decent. This isn't necessary in this video, but eventually I'll be using it. It's a VGA to component cable. Of course, you're gonna need your micro SD card. I would suggest a 256 or 512 gig. 
HDMI male to female flush mount extension cable. DB15 or VGA male to female extension. USB-A male to female flush mount extension cables. A box made in China. This is our mini ITX case that we're gonna completely tear apart and modify and curse at and yell and drill holes in. This is a mini ITX to Mr. adapter. And on the left, I have the back IO panel that I will not be using because I had to redesign it completely for a vertical HDMI. A 3.5 stereo TRS port. You will need access to a 3D printer. You're gonna have to 3D print the back IO panel, the USB hub mount, and the mini ITX to Mr. adapter plate. This is my second iteration of the rear panel IO. I had to move some things around, flip the HDMI from horizontal to vertical to fix some clearance issues. Hopefully I'll have it uploaded to Thingiverse by the time this video is uploaded. Shut up and do it. First thing we're gonna do is delid this case, get all the goodie bags and components out of the inside and uh, get ready to install the mini ITX to Mr. Adapter. You got two Phillips screws to remove this front face plate. We're gonna get this off and then we're gonna remove the power button PCB. Here's just a better look at that board for the power button. Now I'm just test fitting that 19 millimeter power button and it, it's got a little bit of slack a little bit of slop in that bore. These buttons come with an O-ring installed on the threading. What I did is just took both of them and put them on that threading. And that gives it enough diameter to fit tightly in that bore. Now I'm just removing that front PCB for the USB ports. Now originally there was an oval slot here, an oval slot here, and a circle right here in the middle. Using an angle grinder, I made cuts to remove the material between the hole and the two slots. This will allow room for the buttons. Then using a Dremel with a sanding drum, I sanded all those sharp corners off and I also opened up that hole on the left hand side so that the 19 millimeter button would fit. This cross brace here was removed and not used. Here we can see the mini ITX adapter plate sitting in the case. This I did not design, I downloaded it from Thingiverse and I'll add a link, but I had to remove this corner here and also had to notch that out with a Dremel to allow clearance from these uh, screw standoffs that are built into that case. Um, I beveled that back a little bit to clear that metal lip in the front. And after that, I didn't have no issues fitting it to this case. Here we're mounting just the DE10 nano board for now to that ITX adapter plate. Uh, align the holes, screw them in. These are tapered flush head screws that come along with the case that I'm using. Now we take the DE10 nano on the adapter plate, put it in the case, secure it with the four supplied motherboard screws that came with the case. And here's how it should look once it's installed. Here's our heat sink we need to install on this Cyclone chip to keep it cool. And a little money shot of that analog I.O. board. Oh yeah. All right, now we gotta remove that acrylic top so we can get our heat sink and our analog I.O. board on. All right, we got our heat sink. Peeling back a smile. Get it on there straight, shaky. Give it a little pushing. There we go. We are ready to plug her in. You got a row of single pins up here and a double row down there. Make sure you get these lined up. Double check, triple check. 
make sure you're in the hole, fool, before you go pushing. You don't want to bend no pins. Make sure you check from multiple angles that you're lined up and ready to give her that push. I got the HDMI and the VGA ports facing the rear of the case. But once you're happy with the way she's sitting, set her down, brace yourself, and dedicate. Oh yeah, touchdown fresh. Give her one last visual inspection. Make sure you didn't boo-boo anything up. Now we're ready for that serious RAM upgrade. I can feel the power in my hands. Hey, this side faces outward. My friends, socket and rocket. Even after all that action, we still have to screw this and do this. Pace yourself. This is what it looks like when you get the beast in the box. And we are ready to start cabling. Luckily, they supplied a VGA port cutout already for us. Insert your female end of your VGA extension cord through the back port and secure with a washer and a three millimeter nut from that screw set. This was kind of hard to get on, almost like the threading wasn't an exact match, but you're a big boy or girl, you can do it. You're gonna wanna take your HDMI extension cable and pre-shape it Get it bent where it's facing just left of that VGA port and it's in a vertical position. This is considered a left facing HDMI cable when I bought it on Amazon, but it's actually facing to the right. I will link the exact one I bought in the description. Now that we got it somewhat pre-shaped, we can go ahead and screw it to that back IO panel. You just don't want to have to wrestle it after it's already screwed to the plate and you're trying to get everything installed. It's best to get it shaped as close as possible to where it's going to sit once it's installed. Now we can go ahead and insert that back I.O. panel and get it locked in. I like to start at one of the short sides and clip it and then lift up in the middle, kind of arching it out while you pry and push the other side in. Then I work on the bottom, get it clipped in. Once you get the bottom, you can work on the top and kind of push down on that panel while you're pulling up on that metal frame piece that runs along the top. Once you get it snapped in, it's pretty secure. Yeah, and just uh, make sure all those tabs are pushed all the way in and that they're clipped in on the other side. Now we're going to go ahead and plug in the HDMI to the DE10 Nano. Here I'm trying to decide what to do with the excess slack in that VGA cord. I end up running it along that side of the case and making two coils towards the end that I zip tie. I bring it back up. There's a hard right angle coming into that VGA connector going into that Mr. Add-on board. I just kind of hit the jacket coming right into the connector with a lighter just to soften that jacket and put that bend in there. So I don't know, maybe to keep from breaking any of the wires inside. And now I'm zip tying that excess VGA cordage on that side. This is just temporary. I end up coming back and making a lot neater of a coil, but for now it, it keeps it flopping around. Now I'm going to go ahead and solder in this 3.5 millimeter TRS audio port. Um, I'm kind of just staying at that bottom right corner in this system and working my way to the left. Here I'm just judging how much this cord I need to cut off. Here I've trimmed the wire and I'm pulling back that jacket to expose the left right ground. Here I'm adding the shrink wrap tubing so that after those splices are soldered, I can come back and heat shrink it. So these TRS connections stand for tip, ring, and sleeve. And here I'm checking for continuity against the tip, ring, and sleeve to see what colors those indicate. Here I got the wires stripped and I'm just dipping them in some paste flux. Using the third hands contraption to hold the wires, I'm just 
pre-tinning each one of these leads. I give a little donut dunk to the blades on that port. All right, now we just pre-tin each one of those blades. Remember which one is silver, which one's gold, because once you get solder on there, it's hard to tell. And don't forget to add your heat shrink tubing. Now we just solder the three contact leads to the three blades. Pay attention to the colors. I'm gonna throw a diagram up for you. And as long as you're using the same components that I'm using, those are the known specs for these two pieces. Shrinky dink. Slide it. There you go, one custom audio extension cable for the mister. But wait, there's more. You gotta remove part of this segmented jacket so we can get our bend on with this wire. And it's going in a tight, confined space, so we need a little more bendiness. That's a technical term. We gotta get our bend on. There we go, get on off there, damn it. Get on off there. That's what you want right there. We just had to circumcise that bad boy. Now we just feed it on in. Fish it on in. Feed and fish it on in there. Make the insertion. Wait for it. Wait for it. Oh, yeah. Now you're good to go. Shove that little boy on in there. Now this, this little adapter's pressure fit. Uh, that hole, I believe, was a 9.5 millimeter. And it should just snap right in. Just like that. Bootable. All right, we got three of our connectors connected. Tucked in there, looking decent. Still got lots of room. Let's push on, Flintstone. Moving to the left, we have the SD card slot now. We're going to feed it up from underneath, back around, and into the SD card slot of the DE10 Nano. Look at that box. Look at it. Just look at it. After struggling with this longer than I like to admit, I do eventually get this thing out. Cheater. Ah, there she is. Now we're gonna have to do some more feeding and fishing. Feeding and fishing. You gotta figure out which way that card installs on the bottom of the DE10 Nano. Make sure you feed it in the right way and all that goodness. Once you're sure you got it in the right way, go ahead and push that SD card slot mechanism doodad adapter PC thingy on in. And that would just slide that ribbon cable extension underneath the mister. Gently insert like that. Now we're done. Okay, I'm going to skip the USB ports for now, and I'm going to feed this Ethernet cable in underneath the mister. I'm going to warm that jacket up right there where I want to bend. Give it a good little neck break and bend. Hold it there till it cools. Go ahead and plug it in. Then we'll jump down here to the panel side. It'll only go in one way. The bolt holes won't line up if you have it upside down. And we're going to secure it with two more of the three millimeter screws. Now this is where things got tricky. Where the hell do we put this USB hub? I thought about sticking it down here. No good for cable management. Back here, no good for cable management. I decided to stick it up in this top left corner upside down, but to get it there, I had to design and 3D print a mounting holder just for this hub in this case. It's got two holes on the back spaced out to fit the vent holes in this case, although I'm sure it could be adapted to fit other cases. Slide it in and there's a lip in the front that captures it and clips on the top and it allows all your USB cables to be plugged in. I will link to it in the description. 
if you want to use this shitty little mounting device. Here we're just screwing it to the case with a couple eight millimeter long coarse thread plastic screws. Ta-da! Now we can install one of the USB-A extendos. Plug it in, do a little magic tuck and stuff, and get it mounted to the I.O. panel. All right, with the second USB extension cable, I don't want it running over the top of the mister, so I end up pulling it out and doing a sharp 90 degree bend to where it comes right back underneath itself into the left hand corner and comes down to the I.O. panel. All right, we are finally making progress. Now we just have to run the front two USBs and the external button and LEDs for the front panel. We are going to temporarily install this button and this front plate so we can get a guesstimate of the length we need for the power wire that comes from the back input jack to the front power button. So I end up deciding to remove these leads that are already soldered on to this five bolt input jack and I'm gonna solder in my own custom leads. Here we're just pulling the shorties off. Here's some high amp silicone jacket wire I'm just cutting to length. Here we're soldering those leads to that port. Here's our solder joint looking nice stripping wire clamping it soldering it melting that goober in there don't forget to heat shrink don't want any shorts no that's not a joint once we heat shrink those two individual power wires we're gonna slide that bigger heat shrink tubing on to consolidate it in a nice little package pretty I'm gonna go ahead and pop that 19 mil button back in and you're gonna have an issue with tightening that nut on the back. There's two standoffs that were used to screw the original power button PCB board to that face plate. Those standoffs are gonna get in the way of that nut, so we're gonna have to cut them down. Snip, 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 snip. Just get them totally flush with the back of that buttonhole so that we can secure that nut on the back of that button. All right, I threw in the USB to see if there was room for these buttons underneath and there was not, so they gotta go on the other side. This is just the old failed print. I'm gonna use it as a straight edge to score some marks on the back of this front plate so we can get those buttonholes lined up nice and neat. Scribing a center line. Here I'm checking out the overall diameter of that outer button bezel and I set my calipers to roughly half of that. I come over to the right a couple millimeters and mark my center line for that first button. Now if you put two buttons together those hex nuts on the back will interfere unless you have a certain amount of spacing between them just trying to get a rough spacing right now of what's needed to give them enough room for those hex nuts to be tightened to the backside. So 18 millimeters is what I settled on and coming over from the first mark, 18 mils scribing, coming over from that one, 18 mils scribing. It doesn't matter how you go about this as long as they're equally spaced and you have room for the hex nuts. Here I'm just taking a pick tool and putting a little pilot hole divot in each one of those three button points so we can go take it to the drill press. All right, now I'm in the garage. Yes, there's a CRT in the background. We're starting off with a 1 8 inch drill bit, drilling the holes, stepping up to a slightly larger. I do about three or four steps before I go to the final drill bit, which you want its diameter to be within about a half a millimeter of the diameter of the threads of those momentary buttons that we're gonna be using. All right, back inside, 
here was a look at the holes we made. Uh, we can go ahead and install that 19 millimeter button for the last and final time. All right, now we're getting ready to install the 12 millimeter momentary buttons. Remove those O-rings, you don't need them. That'll have them sticking out looking funny on the front. We don't need that on our Mr. Case. Then take those hex nuts and lock those buttons down. They ain't going nowhere. Make sure to situate your buttons all the same way. I got the positives all facing the right hand side. That will make it easier to install the wiring. Now we're putting this USB board back in, screwing her down. The pin on this yellow header, we need to remove one of them for it to fit in this plug here. It only utilizes four pins. On one side, you can stick five in, the other side four. The USB port itself only needs four, so. Anyway, I've attached the extensions. I'm just manipulating this cabling. And then I'm gonna fold this back. And it's gonna be just about the perfect length to reach our USB hub. Now we're just gonna add some zip ties to these wires just to make things neat seats behind this front plate. I'm gonna push the wires back down in the plate and we'll be ready to insert these USB ports into our case and lock this front plate down for the final time. Now we'll go ahead and screw our panel in and we'll put our USB hub mount back that we had to remove to get that left screw in that front face plate. Now we can plug in those front USB ports. And we are getting real close to being done. All we have left is all those front buttons, LEDs, the button functions, and the power source for the power button. So let's just take a little look-see real quick and admire our work. Looking pretty slick. All right, back to work. Need to figure out exactly how long this power wire needs to be. And I'm not gonna do a direct solder to the butt. I'm gonna use female spade quick disconnect terminals. That way in case I ever have to swap the button out down the road, I'm gonna do that with all these buttons. Quick disconnects. Do a little snip and strip. And I'm gonna heat up these shitty hard plastic collars, rip them off so I can get a better connection when I solder or crimp these connectors on. Then I'll add my own heat shrink tubing to cover that whole connector. Here I've added the shrink wrap tubing and I'm just soldering this joint together. Wiping off that flux gooberage with some isopropyl alcohol. Shrinky dink. Okay, before we go any further, I need to explain this button wiring. I'm going to use this shitty diagram. This top prong or common is where we need to input the 5 volt source. Just to the lower left of it is our ground input. We will supply both of these to the button from that 5 volt input power jack that we just soldered together. Alright, easy so far. Now when you push that switch in, it sends power to this middle or normally open prong. So it's this switched power source that we'll send out to the mister board. To get our ground to the mister, we'll just piggyback right off the ground we already have wired up to the butt. It don't need to be switched, we just need to pass it along. All right, the only thing left is to feed five bolts to that right hand prong for the LED. To do that, it's as simple as creating a tiny little jumper right here from the center switched five bolt source to that LED. Uh, that way when you push the button, it'll send 5 volts to the mister and to the LED of that button. Okay, now that we understand that, I'm going to cut off two lengths of this wire to feed from the button to the mister. So now I'm stripping this ground wire and we're just going to splice these two together, twist them, and we're going to insert them into one of those spade connectors. And that will be our ground jumper that will feed the button and also be passed on to the mister. All right, we put our heat shrink tubing on, fluxed it. 
we inserted it in the spade terminal and we're soldering it on. A little look-see. Some shrinkage. Now we have our power input jack. We have it wired up to two spade connectors that go to the button and we have our long ground that will pass on to the MISC. These will connect to that button just like in this video and just like I showed in that diagram. Now I'm going to make that little jumper feed five bolts to that LED. Get that spade connector soldered on for that jumper. We're going to splice it to our long five volt positive wire that will go to the mister. Put the spade connector on it. Get this soldered. Get everything heat shrunk looking nice. And here we get one last look of how it's going to connect to the real button on this extra button. Now we can go ahead and remove these USB cables to make room for this 5 volt out that has the little jumper on it. And that's what it looks like once installed on the butt. Here I've ran that power wire under that USB hub. And you can also see I redid the VGA coiling of that excess and added some zip ties. Getting these spade connectors ready to connect to our button. Insert it through the back I.O. panel. Now we got it inserted. We're going to go ahead and tighten up that hex nut. We're going to route our wires under that USB hub. And now it's time to make all our connections on the butt. Just go along with that diagram. Uh, you got to use needle noses or some tweezers or something to reach down in there. At this point, we're finally done wiring the button and we can move on. But it's also a good time to check the function of that button. I went ahead and plugged in the power supply. See it's getting power. Everything's good. Oh yeah. All right, now we can go ahead and plug back in those USBs. Uh, checking the length we need to power this Mr. Board. Snip, snip. Strip, strip, twisty, twist. Go ahead and put that shrinky dink on there. Put it in that third hand. Give it a little donut dunk. Get it way in there. pre in the wire and the connector. Red goes to the center. Oh yeah, melt it in there like butter. Shrinky dink. Go ahead and squeeze those prongs around that ground. Hold it secure before we solder it. Get your tippy wet. Smear it on there. Oh yeah, shrinky dink. Slide your main big shrinky dinker on there. Hit it up off camera. That's it. Now we got her plugged in, looking fresh, clean, cable management on point for all you ladies. I know you like that. Now we're going to direct our attention to the LED and button headers on this Mr. I.O. board. We got P3 and P4 here. We're going to have to tap into them. We're going to be using 2.54 millimeter JST or XH connectors. We're going to use this little kit to wire up a 7 pin and a 5 pin connector to pull button inputs and LED inputs from the Mr. Board. But before we do that, let me explain some shit. Here we have a close up of our Mr. I.O. board and our three user buttons. From this vantage point, on the left is gonna be our LED positives, and on the right is gonna be our LED negatives. Closest to the camera is gonna be the button input, and farthest from the camera is gonna be the grounds for the button inputs. Here we got our P3 and P4 header ports for our LEDs and our buttons. Here's the polarity for these buttons. This is for the LEDs. Now, if you look at the bottom pin in P3, that is the ground for the buttons. 
we're gonna run it to one of these buttons to the prong closest to the floor of the case then we daisy chain it to the same point on the next two buttons skip the pin directly above the ground then the next one is going to be for reset and it's going to go to our red LED button. The next one up is going to be the OSD button and it's going to go to the yellow LED button. The last pin is our user signal and it's going to the green LED button. Okay, now with the button signals wired, you can focus on the LED signal side very top one of the P4 LED header port is your 5 volt positive. Well, it's actually more like 3.3 volts, but we're going to feed this down to the positive on a button and we're going to daisy chain it to the next two just like you would with a ground. With these LEDs, the negative is actually the signal source. And so we're going to move down to the next pin. That's going to be our red negative. And we're going to connect that to the red button. Moving down from there, we have the yellow negative. We're going to connect that to the yellow button. And moving down one more, we got the green negative. We're going to connect that to the green LED button. This little connection set comes with wires that have the connectors installed already. They got a little tab on one end and you just fit those in the side of the square with a notch and they click into place and you color code it. Only put the wires on the pins that you need them that we just covered in that beautiful diagram I made. And I'm just gonna fast forward through all the rest of this for these connectors cause it's all been explained and I'm tired of talking and I want this video done. There's the ground daisy chain. I'm just cutting these button signal wires to length, stripping them and crimping on a quick disconnect and heat shrink tubing them. That's the button signal wires installed. Now it's time to work on the LEDs.
All right, we finished up the wiring of the buttons. Finally, got this one last connection to make using some long boy tweezers. And I don't know what was worse, building this or editing the video. It's taking a lot longer than I thought it would. And unfortunately, I have more footage of getting the operating system installed, doing an update all, putting it through its paces. But it looks like it's gonna have to wait for another video because I'm ready to wrap this one up. Like I said, this was a lot of work putting this together. I enjoy tinkering with retro shit. If you guys found it interesting at all, please like and subscribe. I'm trying to grow my channel so I can bring more info and modifications and builds like this to the channel. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to you know what.